Hi, welcome to the video ministry here at First Baptist Church. Pastor Darren, and I'm glad that you're joining us again today. We're going to start a whole new series with this video. We're going to be looking at the Beatitudes. There are nine couplets, nine little phrases that, that Jesus gives at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount. You can find that in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and parts of 7 as well. We're just going to be concentrating in this series on the Beatitudes, the opening poem, so to speak, that Jesus uses to begin his teaching there on the Sermon on the Mount. Let me go ahead and read the passage that we're going to be studying over the course of this series, but just to kind of give you a heads up here, today we're not even going to get past the first word. That said, let's give the context here. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, reads this way. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I give you this time. And I pray, Father, that your words would be the words that need to be heard and understood. Thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to teach us with passages like this. Thank you so much for the wisdom and the encouragement and the challenge that you give us. Help us today to rethink how we think, to rethink that concept of success, blessing, self-help. Help us to grasp your vision for us rather than our vision for ourselves. And in so doing, become a little bit more like your son and a lot different than the world. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Words matter. I think sometimes we forget that. I, I, I do remember one time I was working in residential treatment um, for highly abused children. There was one kid that I had a particular fondness for. He, he had a mastery of the English language in that he knew a lot of big words, didn't always know how to use them correctly, and sometimes he got them mixed up a little bit. I remember one particular day, it was my job to do room inspections before breakfast. And my job was to knock on their door. And then when they let me in, I would make sure that they were wearing clothes that were appropriate and that matched. It was also my responsibility to make sure that, that they had made their beds. They, the night shift had done the laundry and they'd put their laundry away and, and uh, their room was cleaned up, their toys were put away and all their belongings were in, in the right spot. And when they passed inspection, then they could go out to, to get to the breakfast table. I knocked on this particular kid's door, and he asked who it was, and I, I said, you know, it's Darren, here to do your room inspection, and he opened the door, and with this magnificent and, and highly dramatized bow, he says, instead of saying, enter therefore ye within, welcome to my humble abode, he, he bowed dramatically and said, enter ye therefore within. Welcome to my humble commode. <laughs> yeah, he had no idea what he had said. And I, I did my level best to not burst out laughing because I really didn't want to hurt his feelings. But words matter. Um, words matter a lot in how we use them and what they're there for. At the time of this recording, uh, there's a couple of athletes that during recording times of them playing video games, let a couple of words out. Both of them stated after they were called on it that they didn't even know what those words meant, that they thought they meant something completely different. 
um, but they were racially insensitive words. And the result is they not only lost their jobs, but paid tens of thousands of dollars of fines simply because they used the wrong words. Words matter. And I think oftentimes we get that in culture, and I think in, our, in the current culture that we're in, we're hypersensitive to words. But when we look at the scriptures, I think oftentimes we forget that words actually matter. And, and we read the scriptures, and sometimes we read passages that are very familiar, and we read them and go, oh, that, that was a cute passage, or wow, that was kind of creative of, for them to put it that way, and wow, I, I learned a couple of things out of that passage, but we're, we're really anxious to move on, to find the meaty part of the passage, and the parts that are going to really change our lives. And we forget that although the big picture is extremely important, context, 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 the words that are chosen matter an awful lot as well. Let me set the stage here before Jesus sits down and begins to teach on that mountain or that hillside or whatever it was as he gives the Sermon on the Mount. Let me give you some background information that I think is essential to understanding the radicalness of Jesus' opening poem here. In Greek and in Roman uh, history and culture, there was a concept that was pervasive in their worlds, and it had been pervasive for centuries. The concept, in the Greek at least, the word is eudaimonia. I remember that because it kind of reminds me of like eudaimon, um, eudaimonia, um, and and the concept here is that words heal, and and if you just get the right teaching, if you just get the right phrase to stick in your head, you just get the right teacher, that they can give you the words that will heal your anxiety, that will heal your your struggle, that will heal your insomnia, that will heal your headaches that will heal your life so that you can find the contentment, you can find the things. You just have to find the right teaching. You have to retrain your brain to become human flourishing. Human flourishing is the direct translation of eudaimonia. Well, that was very much a part of the Greek and the Roman cultures. In fact, you know, Aristotle, Plato, those kinds of people they would do this with their philosophies. They would go into a community, they would sit down in the city square, and they would begin to teach. And they wouldn't give a full lecture, they just give kind of a little trailer or a little teaser of, you know, let me tell you what I think life is all about. And they tell you, tell the people that were listening this, a little bit of something, and the people would go, wow, that was deep, oh, that was amazing, oh, I want to hear more. And would you like to hear more, Aristotle and Plato and other people like them would say? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, because, you know, if I hear a little bit more of this, you're going to make my life so much better with what you're teaching. You're going to change my perspective. You're going to change how I think, how I feel, and it's going to make my life so much better. I'm going to be healthier as a, as a person. I'm going to be more successful in life. I just need more information. And Aristotle, Plato, and people like that would go, okay, pay up. And so you'd pay them to become their student or their disciple. You would pay them to do that, and then they would teach you. As long as your tuition was paid up, you would continue to be able to learn more and thus make yourself more successful. The Jewish tradition, the Jewish culture, actually bought this idea from the Greeks and the Romans. Old Testament, you would go to the synagogue and, and you would have a rabbi teach you. It wouldn't cost you. That was a part of your, your taxes. That was part of your, your offerings, all that kind of stuff. And everybody kind of had access to it. Well, by the time Jesus arrives on the scene, they've totally bought into this Greek and this Roman idea of, of eudaimonia, meaning teachers, rabbis would go into communities and say, I'd like to tell you what the prophets meant by this statement. 
And so they would teach a little bit about what the prophets meant about this or what this psalm actually was talking about or what Moses meant when he said this in the Old Testament law. And Jews would come and they would listen to this and go, oh, wow, that's pretty impressive. Oh, I want to learn more. And can, can you teach us more? I want to hear more because the more I learn from you, the better my life is going to be, the, the more successful I'm going to be in life. I just need you to hear more words so that I can absorb those words and thus become better. Human flourishing. And the rabbi would go, oh, you'd like to learn more. Okay. Okay pay up. Give me some more money. And I will teach you more. And the more I teach you, the better you will become. Eudaimonia. I think it's very interesting to note that the word, although it was extraordinarily pervasive in New Testament time and culture, the word eudaimonia never shows up in the biblical text. Never shows up. Be kind of like me sitting down and writing a book about what God wants of you and never using the words self-help in the book in today's culture. Never using the words pick yourself up by the, your own bootstraps. Never using the words retrain your brain or stinking thinking. Never using those words because those are contrary to the message that I'm trying to get across. I don't think we recognize just how radical Jesus was when he gave the Sermon on the Mount and specifically when he gave us the Beatitudes. Those nine little couplets, those nine little dual phrases. And it all begins with the first word. He says, blessed. Now, you sit there and you go, okay, he said blessed. What does that mean? Stop and think about this. In the culture in which Jesus is living, eudaimonia is the, the way of, of life, the, the, the cultural current of the day. You need to train your brain with correct words and when you train your brain with correct words, with correct teaching, with correct philosophy, you will be a better person. You will be more successful. Jesus doesn't say anything about you making yourself more successful. Instead, he says a radically different thing. He says, blessed. Blessed. Just stay there for a second. What does that mean? Here's the question that I want to pose to you about that. How does one bless themselves? With eudaimonia, the idea is I am going to make myself better by, by picking and choosing teachings that will put together and, and, and you know, put it together in my head and I will become a better person because I applied these, these things because I have the right words, I have the right perspectives, I have the right wisdom, I have all the right stuff that I put up here and I plugged in, right? I'm going to make myself better. Jesus says, blessed are those. How does one bless oneself? The answer is, you can't. If I could bless myself, it's not blessing myself. That's achieving something. And Jesus isn't talking about achievement here. He's talking about blessing. Here's the truth of the matter. In order for someone to be blessed, there needs to be a blesser. I give you a $100 bill. I bless you with a $100 bill. Where did that $100 bill come from? Did you sit there and go, Oh, I want a $100 bill. Oh, I want a $100 bill. Did you think that $100 bill into existence? Nope. Did you stand up in front of everybody and, and do this magnificent, wonderful dance or oration or song, and suddenly we all felt compelled to pay you because that's what the contract said to do? No. 
blessing comes from someone else to you. Jesus says nine times at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are those. Meaning, this isn't something that you can do on your own. You need to have somebody do it to you, give it to you. Every single one of these, every single one of these Beatitudes, God does something to the one that he's talking about here. None of this is self-help. None of this is self-created. None of this is, is because somebody figured out a smart goal and they achieved their goal. Jesus is being very clear here that if you want to get to a place of places like contentment or success or things like that, there are things that, yes, you're going to have to do, but all of the results of that is going to come from God. This isn't about achievement. This is about faithfulness. See, here's the lie. And it's a lie that was alive loud and clear in Jesus' day, and it's a lie that is allowed and clear in today's world as well. Here's the lie. Betterment all starts with me, and it starts up here in my head. I just have to fix the stinking thinking. Now, I'm not saying that stinking thinking is it doesn't exist. It does exist. But one of the ways stinking thinking shows up is when I say, I can fix it. I just have to think differently. I just have to fix it so that what happens up here runs down my arm and trickles out here, and suddenly everything is okay because I did it. Now, I understand that I'm walking a very tight rope here because there is a thing about doing. I mean, the, the whole concept of let go and let God, I don't find that very biblical. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. James tells us faith without works is dead. So there is a matter of doing. And when you look at these Beatitudes, you're going to see one after the other, that there is a certain level of sweat and, and, and commitment to these different core values of God. These are not going to come easy. But it's not me that's going to end up doing the results. I can't look at, you know, being more humble or being meek and then going, okay, here's my reward. This is what I earned or this is what I created. I don't create the results. That's extremely important. I might think I'm doing a great job when really, in reality, without God, I'm not doing anything. I think one of the most painful verses I think I, I ever read, Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become ones who are unclean and our best deeds are nothing more than filthy rags. Our best deeds, when we sit back and go, this is one of my biggest life achievements. God looks at that and goes, eh, that's a shop rag. In fact, that's a shop rag that I'm thinking about throwing out. The joke is told of a guy who, who finally figured out how to take it with him. When he died, he, he was going to be able to take all of his earthly possessions with him. He just had to change it into gold. And so, so he changed it into gold. And when he died, he showed up at the pearly gates and Jesus met him there. And he has this, this bag in his hand of all the gold that he's ever earned. He figured out how to take it with him. And Jesus looks at him and goes, so uh, what you got there in the bag? And the guy's like, I, I figured out how to bring it all with me. I figured it out. And God says, well, let me see. Well, I'm interested to see what you got in there. And so the guy carefully and very reverently opens up the bag and Jesus looks in and goes, oh, pothole filler. 
We actually got plenty of that. Hmm. Took it up in gold. What are the streets made of? Made of gold. It's pothole filler. I think sometimes when we buy, especially into that concept of eudaimonia or that, that ability that I am going to do this and I am going to make this work and it's all up to me, we fill our, our, our achievements so full of pride that it becomes contaminated to the point in which it makes the stomach of God turn. It makes God want to throw us up. Those aren't my words. Those are Jesus' words in Revelation. The concept of blessedness, blessing, yes, there is a piece of us that needs to, to be willing to be faithful and do whatever it takes to be faithful, but I'm not the one who creates the results. It's God who creates the results. Jesus put it this way. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, <coughs> excuse me. On, on Sunday morning, this preaches really, really well, doesn't it? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Oh Lord, thank you for for all that you've done for us, and thank you for you know causing the sun to rise and set on a consistent level, and thank you for all of the 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 many blessings that you have given us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then we go to work on Monday, and it's like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, this is what I'm going to do tomorrow. This I'm going to have it all worked out so that by Friday I have it figured out and I, I, I'll be the man. Eudaimonia. I will be the man. I will be human flourishing. I got it worked out. The time in which I'm recording this, I just got back from a Bible study. Uh, and one of the guys in the Bible study really pointed something else and it really just kind of struck at my heart because this is exactly what what Jesus is pointing at here just with this first word blessed he asked a question of us how many times do we see an opportunity or do we see even a time frame and I've got this afternoon open or I've got tomorrow morning open how many times do we sit down and fold our hands and close our eyes and get on our knees and say, okay, God, prepare me for this time because I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen there. Prepare me for this. Open my eyes to what you want to accomplish in this. Show me how you want to use me in that time frame. And then use me. How many times do we actually pray that prayer? I'm sitting there kind of you know, gritting my teeth and, and, and fiddling with my hands, feeling very uncomfortable. Because I can't tell you how many times I've looked at this book as, as the answer guide, but you know what? I use it when I need it. Right now I don't need it because I got it all figured out. I got it all worked out in my head as to how this is going to work. Because you know why? I've been listening to the right people. I've been listening to the right teachers. I've actually been listening to some of the, the teachers as they teach about the scriptures. I got it figured out, said every single Pharisee and Sadducee in Jesus' day. And yet, when God showed up in their midst, right in front of them, they couldn't wait to kill him. I have to be honest with myself. Apart from God, I can do nothing. Everything I think I've achieved, I haven't achieved it. I was blessed with it. God gave it to me. And you sit there, and, and I sit there and fight that a little bit. No, I, I remember taking the finals for, for the master's degree. I, I took the finals for, for the, the undergraduate. I took the finals for my high school diploma. Um, I, I wrote the paper for ordination. 
I earned those things. No, 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 no. Apart from God, I can do nothing. If God wasn't available for me and teaching me and walking me through that, even just the health piece of it, if God hadn't given me a decent health, I wouldn't have accomplished those things. I wouldn't have been able to do any of those things. Apart from God, I can do nothing. Yes, I worked hard during those times. But the results were because God blessed me, not because I achieved. Eudaimonia, not Darren, not you, not anything. And this is the sad part for me. Go into a bookstore. What do you see? You see a little bit of history. You see a little bit of humor. You see quite a bit of fiction. And the vast majority of every bookstore that I've ever been in is what? Self-help. Read this book and you'll be better. Read this book and it will fix your problems. Read this book and you will lose 50 pounds. Read this book and, the, and read this book, read this book, read this book. There are thousands of them out there, all preaching the same thing. Words heal. Get the right philosophy going here and you will be able to solve every problem that you face. And And... and that's including Christian bookstores, too. I'm not talking about, you know, Barnes & Noble and things like that. I'm talking about Christian bookstores as well. Read this book and it will fix your problems. And I'm not saying that there aren't truths in those things. I'm saying get your perspective correct. God, Jesus, is the vine. You're the branches. I have yet to see a branch on an apple tree go, mm-hmm. and there's an apple doesn't work that way. Flowers. What happens when you cut the flower and put it in a vase? The moment you cut that flower off of the branch, it begins to die, right? And Jesus addresses the crowd and says, blessed. Instead of saying, eudaimonia. He's talking about that absolute necessary connection that you have with God and God has with you. That that interaction that you have with God. That's what he's talking about from the very first word. Because it says here, apart from me, you can do nothing. Flip side to that coin. With God, Nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Jesus says here with these Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say, if you think differently a little bit here and there, then you've earned heaven. He doesn't say that. Blessed, God blesses those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Not, hey, if you take on a mournful attitude, you will will be comforted. So learn how to mourn. Learn the the prospects of it. Learn the five steps of proper mourning. And when you get those five steps down, then you will be complete in your mourning. He doesn't say that. He says, when you're mourning, you will be blessed by God, with comfort. When you are willing to look at yourself in the mirror and realize the poorness of your spirit, the kingdom of heaven is yours. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, God will bless you with being full. It's not about what I do, although there is some doing in there, isn't there? But it's not about what I do that gets me what I want. It's not about me. It's about the relationship that I have with God. And this goes back to the very beginning of human existence. Cain is frustrated with God because 
God doesn't accept his, his sacrifice. And, you know, Cain has a beautiful opportunity here. He has a beautiful opportunity to go to Abel and say, okay, help me understand why I messed up. He has a beautiful opportunity to step back and go, okay, God, you didn't accept my, my, my offering. Help me understand. What was wrong? What, was it my heart? Was it the gift? Was it, was it the timing? He didn't work on this relationship with God. He just decides that the best thing to do is to get Cain or get Abel out of the way, right? What does God do? God shows up as, as Cain is headed towards Abel to fix his problem. God shows up and he speaks to Abel, Cain. And he says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Accepted by who? By, by Abel? By dad? By mom? Accepted by who? The only person that really matters, God. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door and it desires to have you, but you must master it. Do you see how he thought, if I just change my circumstances, I will be the successful one. And God says, don't, don't take this on. Your success is not up to you. It's up to me. Let's work on this together. I want to read you a psalm. I want to read this to you. And I want you to listen to how the author of this psalm completely rejects the concept of eudaimonia or the concept of a human being being responsible for their own flourishing. I want you to hear the author's heart as to how their faithfulness is received by God and what God does with that faithfulness, that connection, that blessedness that Jesus is going to be talking about in all nine of these statements of the Beatitudes. Psalm 91 reads this way. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On, the hand, on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name, declares the Lord. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. And with long life, I, says the Lord, will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Did you pick up on that? Yes. The author of this is talking about faithfulness to God. He who dwells in the house of the Most High. He who loves me and calls on me, and calls upon my name in times of trouble. There is a part of what we need to do to make this work, that there, there is expectations that God has for us, but we are not responsible for the outcome. We are not responsible 
for the success, for the protection that God gives. Those are blessings that come to us. We have long since bought into the notion that we are masters of our own universe, that we are, are the ones who pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps and create our own success. If you can dream it, you can achieve it. Lie. If God inspires you to it, he will bless you to it. Truth. So as we go through all of these different things, I hope that you, you hold on to this truth. And I hope you hold on to this truth, not just in these sermon series as well. God blesses. If you're flourishing in life, if you're experiencing contentment, success, health, if you're learning and you're growing, those are blessings from above. As James put it, all good things come from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. If there is good in your life, it's because God gave it to you. God blessed you. Don't look in the mirror and claim it as yourself. Don't say, that's what I did. My name's on that. No, 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 no. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Not look at what that poor in spirit achieved. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven given to them by the blesser. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Inherit the earth from whom? From the blesser. This isn't about picking yourself up by your bootstraps. This is about being faithful to a God who is faithful to you. Be blessed. Remember what that means. You cannot bless yourself. Be blessed this week. Have a great week.